the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I need God. So do you. So come on, join me. Stand to your feet and let's go before the Lord. Thanks, Bob. Father, we just thank you and give you the praise, give you the glory, give you the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, how grateful we are, Father, that we can come boldly before the throne of grace, make our petitions known. Father, we haven't come into this place to hear from a man or woman, but we've come into this place to hear from the teacher of the church, who is the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, give you the glory, give you all the honor, how good it is to be in the house of the Lord. Now, Lord, we would ask that you bless all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless them, Lord. Bless our brothers and sisters, our Catholic brothers and sisters, and Adventist brothers and sisters and Baptist brothers and sisters and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics and Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis, Inland Christian Center, The Way, Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist, Ecclesia Church, Lord. At no time, Father, no time do we think of ourselves as better than them, but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom, not a man's, uh uh-uh, but yours. And God will give you the praise, give you the glory. Allow your word, cause your word today to explode on the inside of our hearts. Here's our hearts. Fill it with your way and your will. Jesus' mighty name with a great big shout we all say, Amen. Amen. Well, go with me if you will into Hebrews in the third chapter as we continue our study in the word of the Lord. This is how to say no to God. If you were here in part number one, this is part number two. Part number one is you don't want to say no to God. Bottom line, it's kind of like a tongue-in-cheek title. When you say no to God, you end up messed up and end up in trouble and you find yourself a mess in your marriage and your family, children, everything. Nothing seems to work well. You're always constantly dissatisfied and laboring in life. And yet when you say yes to God, you follow God, it may seem strange, but fabulous things take place and life starts to become a blessing. I want to just share something with you before I go any further. You be the judge of this. If I as a pastor today could share with you a simple little three-part formula that is so simple to do and to fulfill And that if I could promise you, promise now, that God will bless your socks off beyond what you could ever imagine or ever dream. And you know darn well you want to be blessed. You know it. And if I could share with you a simple little principle that if you just simply do, and you're already practically doing it, that God will bring you into a new area of blessings. I know there's not a person in this building that wouldn't want to hear that. In order for that to happen today, and I know you want it, simple stuff on how to get blessed, I want you to listen today. This part number two is an interesting thing, but let me just take a moment. As we looked at Hebrews, the third chapter, we saw the children of Israel. It's really a story about them, but it's really a story about you. Because this is not a history lesson that we learn about the children in the past that served God, that didn't serve God, but it's really about how you take them as an example on how you should live your life so that you could get blessed yourself. So the stories that we hear from the Old Testament took place thousands of years ago are stories really about you today on how to have great marriages, how to raise your children, how to prosper in your business, how to be successful in life, 
how to deal with relatives and situations and how when stuff comes at you that's uncomfortable and puts pressure on you, how to make life continue to work until all of that passes and you still remain blessed. All of which you find as we look at the word of God. We found out there were four ways, uh, three ways last week that people say no to God. And by the way, when they say no to God, without even knowing they're saying no to God, oftentimes they're saying no to God with their lifestyle. Oftentimes they're saying no to God with what they think. Oftentimes they say no to God by their expressions. Sometimes it's not just a word out of their mouth that says no to God. They just ignore God or not incorporate God in their life. And that's a shout about how to say no to God. And those people ended up a derelict. We saw three things last week that the children of Israel failed to do as they were wanting and God desiring for them to enter into their promised land. God has a promised land to you. And these things we could do so we never enter into our own personal promised land. I'm not talking about heaven. I'm talking about you being blessed on this earth. I'm talking about you being the witness and living life more abundantly while you're here on earth. And then the icing on the cake is you get to go to heaven. But I want you to know something. I'm talking about that right now. We saw that number one, it was unbelief. That when your circumstances of life become bigger and shout louder than your faith in God and God's word, you will fail and you will say no to God. You cannot let the circumstances of life speak louder to you than what God says. The second thing we found out is that you cannot ignore the presence of God. When you do, you're saying no to God. In other words, in your life as circumstances and you're facing them, you will not know how to make them work. You will not know how you can get it done. You will not have the ability. You will not have the talent. You will not have the gifting. There is no way you're going to make it. But until you bring God into the situation, you're out there by yourself. And when you ignore the presence of God and try to figure out and calculate life without God, you have said no to the presence of God. Are you following me so far? Because in the equation of your life, you've got to bring God into the situation. Life in the natural says two plus two is four. That can't change in the natural. But may I say this to you? With God, two plus two is whatever God says it's going to be. And that's when you bring God into this. You don't know how you're going to do it, but two words, but God. Third thing we found out that's a shout out about how to say no to God is when you operate in sin. Sin is that which is contrary to the ways of God. You just go ahead and live your life that way. You accept it that way. It's contrary to the ways of God. We found out something else. Doesn't matter what the majority of people say. Doesn't matter what society says. I don't care if everybody on the planet says this is the way it is and we agree to it. If God says it isn't, then you got to go with God. You cannot live your life based on the evil and the sin of anybody else that's contrary to the ways of God. And oftentimes we accept stuff in our life that we think is okay when in fact God says it's not okay and we're really saying no to God. Is anybody listening? Today I only have one point, number four, and it's a big one. How to say no to God is that you are in an operation called rebellion. And we'll see that in the scripture. Rebellion is when you hear from God and you say no to God. You simply hear from God and you say no to God. Rebellion doesn't work unless there's a commitment. Rebellion can't happen unless there's an association. Rebellion doesn't take place unless there's some kind of oneness, some kind of following. I cannot go to your children and say to your children, do this, this, and thus, and your children don't do it, and I say, you're rebellious. Because guess what? They have no commitment to me, therefore they have no responsibility to me. But where they have a commitment is when there's a responsibility and an association. 
And when you got saved and when you gave your heart to Jesus, when you started calling yourself a Christian, now there's an association, there is, if you will, a responsibility on your part to hear what the Word of God has to say and do what the Word of God has to say. Because if you hear it and don't do it, you are now considered by God to be rebellious. Are you hearing me? And it will stop you from your promise land. It will cause you to be exactly opposite of what I talked about earlier about getting into the flow of blessings. Instead of getting into the flow of the blessings of God, you will be in the flow of the cursings of God because God spoke and guess what? You said no. Now there's a lot of times we don't even know when we say no, but we say it with our lifestyle oftentimes. I want to take you, if I may, to Hebrews, the third chapter, this time starting in verse number, if you will, 15. While it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. Stop and think about it. God calls a time in the lives of the children of Israel as they were headed towards their promised land by the way that God wanted to give them, but they never got there. Listen to this. And God wants to take you to your personal promised land, but that doesn't mean you're going to get there because there was a time in their life that's called the rebellion. Hear this word. Take, check it out. While it is said today, if you hear his voice. Biggest little word in the Bible is the word if. The word if means you could or not, or could not. It's your choice, it's your call. Sometimes we think we hear, but we really don't hear because we really don't do. So sometimes you're not really hearing at all. You hear a sound coming, but you don't know what it means or how it works in your life, nor does it ever been digested into the heart long enough so that it comes out and becomes part of your life. So in order for you to do something that you're not in the rebellion like the children of Israel kept from your own promised land you're going to have to hear his voice and not harden your hearts. Verse number 16 comes along and makes this statement who having heard rebelled. They heard from God Sometimes we hear from God and we say no with our lifestyle, how we do things and how we do life. We justify where we're at and why we don't. But let me tell you something. When you've heard from God, who knows the best? You are God. God knows best for you. Therefore, you've got to follow God. Oftentimes, what you hear will be contrary to what you feel. Oftentimes, what you hear from God won't feel very good to you. Oftentimes, Times it won't make sense to you, but God will tell you what it is. Oftentimes it doesn't make a, 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 a bit of a, a, a mental capacity where you can grab a hold of it and understand it. But guess what? When God spoke it, you grab a hold of it and you do it. And without that, my friends, you and I are going to fail. Listen to this. Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? They all heard, they all saw. They all failed because they were rebellious. Is anybody listening? I don't want to be that way, and you don't want to be that way either. Verse number 17 comes along. Now in whom he was angry for 40 years. Aren't you amazed that God could be so long-suffering with us? Did you know when you screw up one time, two times, three times, four or five times, God's not just floating around in some cosmic cloud ready to hit you in the head with a two by four? Did you know that God is long suffering, loves you and is patient with you, cares about you instead of judgment coming right away immediately? He'll work with you and work with you and help you and try to get you going, get you into a right place where somebody tells you the truth, trying to get you to turn around so you can see God, hear from God, follow God, and get yourself blessed. Because God wants to take you to your own personal promise. Life. Forty years he was angry with these people, but listen to what happened to them. Because they sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness, finally they failed so much, they never got into their promised land. You have a choice this morning. You can get into your own personal promised land by God. I'm going to show you how to do it, just as simple as possible. Or you can 
can stay back and live your life until you finally die in the wilderness and let the sun scorch your bones in the wilderness. And nobody wants that. But I'm here to tell you, there's good news ahead of you. God wants to bless you. God's long-suffering with you and I, takes care of you and I, and loves us, and wants to help us get to where we need to be because he cares about you getting into your own personal promised land and getting me into my own personal promised land. Somebody ought to give me a great big amen. Some things you need to know about rebellion because notice what it says. They heard, but they rebelled. Listen to this. They have a, there's a refusal to obey. When you will refuse to obey, it's rebellion, my friends. When you hear and you refuse to obey, here's Nehemiah, it's building the wall. Nehemiah, the ninth chapter, if you've got your Bibles, turn there, let's take a look at something. In Nehemiah, the ninth chapter, it says these words. They refused, notice this, to obey. And they were not mindful of the wonders in which God had done among them. But they hardened their necks. And in their rebellion, God just described what rebellion was all about. They hardened their hearts. They refused to obey. They never kept their mind on God. It was always on something else besides the greatness of God. Today, when situations, conditions, circumstances of life are overwhelming, they come at you and you don't know how you're going to make it. It's a simple formula. You just got to keep your heart fixed on him. He's a great God that takes nothing and makes something out of it. He's a God that takes the dead and makes it alive. He's a God that opens up the, the blessings of heaven and pours them out upon you. He's a God that can say yes and amen to. He's a God that does great and mighty and marvelous things beyond what you could ever imagine. They forgot the wonder of God. They didn't have their mind filled with the wonder of God. They had their mind filled with the condition, the situations, the circumstances of their own personal life, and they ended up failing. When you refuse to obey and have your mind filled with a bunch of trash instead of the word of the Lord, you will find yourself being kept out of your own personal promised land. And today I'm here to announce to you, hear me again, today I'm I'm here to announce to you one more time today I am here to announce to you that God loves you and God wants to take you into your own personal promised land they refuse to obey and when you refuse to obey it is rebellion the second thing we're going to look at in Nehemiah the ninth chapter is a fascinating thing. When you see God's word as if there's not importance to it and treat God's word as if it's not important, you are missing God. Listen closely to what it says in verse number 26, just popping up on the overhead. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you. Cast your law behind their backs and killed your prophets. I don't even want to go to the last part of that. They cast the law behind their backs. Do you know what that means? That's an interesting statement. They took the things of God, what God spoke, and they paid no attention to it. It means that they didn't see the word of God as important at all. Listen to me. Have you ever been in a group where four or five people are talking in a circle? All of a sudden, someone who's talking is talking to one person in that group. You're left out. And it won't be very long before you feel, before you know that you're not important to the person that's doing the talking. Only to the person he's talking to. Only to that person he's trying to impress. To you, he's turned his back on you. And you're back here hearing the words, but he's talking to this person over here. You can find out where people are at just by their body language. God's not any different. And when they turn their back on you, what they're saying is you're not important. And when you turn your back on God's word, what you're saying is something else is more important and I've put the word of God behind me instead of forward in front of me. Are you listening to what I'm saying? And they literally got to a place where the word of God is not very important in their life and they ended up in a rebellious condition. The word of God has got to be first and foremost. It's the heart 
heartbeat of God. It's the very character, nature, and attributes of God. It's what this is really all about. You and I have got to see the word of God as very important. I want to say it again for some of you. You have got to see the word of God as vitally important to your future. Now, listen to me. You can hear me, but you haven't yet associated with that. How do you make the word of God vitally important when you come into the house of God and you don't even bring your Bible? How do you make the word of God very important in your life when you forget the message that was ministered under the anointing of the Holy Spirit? I'm not trying to pick on you. I'm not trying to put condemnation on you. I'm not trying to put guilt on you. I'm just trying to point out a fact to you. You shouldn't come into the house of God where the word of God is first and foremost, where the word of God is taught line by pond line and not have a Bible in your hands to make notes of and stuff. I love your iPhones and your iPads. Go for it. But you better not be texting because God knows it. And I want you to know something. You can't mess with God. He gets the message before you ever push the button. Are you following me? And we need to take serious. Stop and think about it, how serious this is. Do you even remember what I preached three weeks ago? I'll let you off the hook. Of course you don't. Pastor Dan was in the prophet three weeks ago. Thank God you got off the hook on that one. But the point is, I'm not asking you to quote what anybody says in the pulpit. You just have to be ready with the word of God. Do you know why? Because circumstances that want to stop you from your promised land, have you ever noticed, will pop up out of the blue. All of a sudden, you go to do something, and you turn your key to your car. You're on your way, but the car doesn't stop, and it's like, ah! You better be ready with God's under control and all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and it'll be okay. I need to settle down and be a man of God. And see, you need to practice what you learn about the things of God. I'm not trying to pick on you again. I'm just trying to encourage you to make that commitment to make the word of God of great importance and not turn your back on the things of God. Last verses. I promised you I would show you simply how to get blessed. Simply. Now I found out about us humans, we like it easy. We like it tasty. We like it fast. And we like it cheap. <laughs> so here it is. Tasty, fast, easy, but it's not cheap. It costs Jesus his life. And I'll show you how to get blessed in every area of your life. When I talk about every area of your life, I'm talking about every area of your life. And it's a promise from God. James, first chapter, verse 17. Some of you may not know this, but James is a half-brother of Jesus. Different daddies, same mom. James, listen closely to what I'm going to say to you. Half-brother of Jesus. Same blood in him as Jesus. He was the senior pastor of a great church of Jerusalem. Probably hundreds of thousands of people or 100,000 people. I don't know. Just tradition tells us it was great and big. James writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, knowing full well who his half-brother is and was. Stop and think about that. Most brothers wouldn't follow other brothers unless they know he's really different. This one follows because he knows he's the Messiah. And he makes these comments in verse 19 of the first chapter of James. In this, I will show you three areas that you can get blessed, so pay attention. 
So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak and slow to wrath. You ought to know how you're going to act. Here's how. Number one, you ought to be, listen to this, swift to hear. Whatever it takes to hear, I'm listening. I want to hear what God has to say. Make hearing a priority. Then the Bible comes along, verse number 19, says slow to speak. Stop talking so much, shut up and listen. Get out of your own opinions and start listening for the voice of the Lord. In fact, I heard it said one time, everybody has a right to their opinion. It's just not every opinion is right. Number three, listen to this, slow to wrath. Because wrath doesn't get you anywhere, faith gets you everywhere. Anger doesn't get you anywhere, but faith gets you everywhere. I haven't gotten into the three parts that are going to bless you yet. That's just a prelude. Is that okay? Because it was so good, I didn't want to pass it up. Verse number 20, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. For those of you that have temper problems, stop it and shut up. You want to change the world you're living in? Love never fails. Is anybody listening? You ought to memorize that verse, especially you wives that have husbands that blow up. It's a great verse to write down on a piece of paper and put it under his mattress. I didn't say talk to him and nag him about it. Just put it under his mattress and say, God, I'm believing this is going to come to pass. I have no idea where that came from. I hadn't said that in any of the other messages. Verse number 21, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word and which has the ability to save your soul. See the word implanted? The word there in the old King James is the word engrafted. It means etched in or built in like you would take a plant and you would engraft one part of the plant into another. The word of God, listen to what it says, the word of God has the ability when you receive Receive it with meekness to be mixed together with your heart. Engrafted into your heart. Not just as something on the outside, but something that was etched into the inside. Something that was cut into the inside. And I used this example before, but I want you to understand this. It's a horticultural example, but I'm trying to make a point of how the words are etched in. And if you ever thought about the word of God, notice the word meekness up there. You've got to receive the word of God with meekness. You know what that means? Flexibility. You can't hold on to your ways and do God's ways. You can't hold on to your thinking and do what God thinks. You can't go home, hold on to your plan and then do God's plan. You can't have your own ideologies and philosophies and you've got to do God's ways and God's will. That's what this is all about. And that's what the word meekness up there it doesn't mean a low lifer. It doesn't it means somebody who's weak and has no power. It just means somebody that says, I am willing to change not to what's wrong. I'm willing to change to what's right. I need to get out of myself and do what God wants me to do. And that's what the word meekness means. And then it says implanted word. In other words, one that's engrafted, one that's etched into the stones of your heart. Have you ever seen a little trophy where they take a little plaque and they etch it in the letters? Have you ever wondered why they etch those letters into a plaque? Because years later, it'll still be etched in. It's actually engraved. It's actually, if you will, uh, uh, engraved in, cut in. Years later, if they painted it on, it would fall off. If they painted it on, it would fade and fall away after years. But when it's etched in, it's there forever. And the same thing with an engrafting. It becomes part of it. It's like a tombstone where you have the marble. They don't paint in someone's name. Here lies, you know, Joe Johnson or, or whatever. They, they etch it in. They engraft it in. They, they, they chip it in. They build it in. And now it's part for a hundred years. You'll know who lies in that grave. Not just something. When the word of God with meekness is received in your heart and it's etched in and grafted in to your heart becomes part of your life. Can't do that unless you've placed an importance on it. Can't do that unless you're ready, meekness, to obey. In other words, you're in rebellion. Listen to these words. It goes on in verse number 22. But be doers of the word. 
I love the word. It says, but be doers of the word. Wait a minute, I thought all I had to do was get the word engrafted into my heart, ingrained, uh, entrenched inside of my heart. See, I can get it inside of my heart and never be a doer of the word. In fact, many times, I've been over the last 35 years, I've probably had thousands of married counselings where I have started off and said, well, here's your problem. Your problem is the Word of God says, and I will start a sentence that the Word of God says, and the man or the woman will finish the sentence. What does that mean? It's engrafted in their heart, but they're not doing it. You can know this stuff and still not do it. Are you following me? You can know it, you can quote it, you can preach it and still not do it. Did you know that a preacher, he is anointed to preach the gospel, but he's not any more anointed to do it than you are? He has to practice it like you do. If he doesn't, he'll fail. <sighs> That's why Paul says, man, I just wanna make sure I don't fall to these things in the ninth chapter of 1 Corinthians into sin. But be doers of the words and not hearers only. And see the last two words, deceivers of yourself? You trick yourself. Listen, if you knew somebody was tricking you, you wouldn't hang around them. If you knew somebody was tricking you, you wouldn't like them. If you knew somebody was tricking you, you'd be mad and angry about it. You would do something about it if somebody was tricking you. And here it comes along. When you're a hearer and not a doer, you trick yourself. Children of Israel didn't enter into the promised land. They died off and their carcasses were in the, baked in the sun in the wilderness. And guess what happened? It was a heartbreak to God, but it was also a loss to them. Guess whose fault it was? God's? No. Guess whose fault it was? Moses? No. Guess whose fault it was? Theirs. And they can blame God all they want. And they can point to somebody else all they want. And it's about that person, about that person. We're real good at accusing everybody else. But guess what? When we hear the word of God and don't do it, we have now tricked ourselves. <laughs> it's what he says. Verse number 23 comes along and says this. For if anyone is a hearer of the word of God is not a doer, he is like a man observing in his natural face in a mirror. In other words, he sees himself, but he's out of focus. The mirror in those days weren't mirrors like you have today. They were just shiny pieces of anything that would shine and show something back. It was totally like, you know, like crazy. They weren't really even considered mirrors. Something that basically had a reflection. That's all it was. That was called a mirror in those days. Your mirrors are clear. Have you ever been to a fun house and they had those mirrors that are all wavy and everything? You stood towards the ones that made you look big. Then the next one you went back made you look like you were a tank. And you hated that one. You went back to the one that looked good and you posed it. I'm telling you, that, that, that's good compared to their mirrors. So what God's really saying, when you're a hearer and not a doer, you're out of focus with life. If you're out of focus with life, you can't hit the target. One more time, if you're out of focus with life, you can't hit the target. God wants you to be in focus so you can hit the target. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Verse number 24 comes along and then he says this, and he who observes himself goes away and immediately forgets. And what kind of a man he was. Why? Because he was out of focus, he now forgets. Did you know that we remember things that are in focus? In fact, that's why HDTV came in because it was a better focus than the others and they have no way in the world to compete with HD with the old technology. So they got rid of it, brought in HD. Why? Because everything is about focus. When things are clear, you want them. When things are not clear, you'll forget them. Is anybody listening? But verse number 25 tells you three simple things to do in order to get blessed. So let's just forget it, and next week we'll come back. Is that okay? Because you really aren't listening anyway, are you? Yeah. All right, so you really want me to go to verse number 25? Because in verse number 25, it tells you how to simply get blessed in your life. And guess what, man? You're the one that's going to have to do something, two things, hear it, and do it. But there is a third thing. Let's look at verse number 25. 
In verse number 25, but he who looks in the perfect law of liberty, stop right there. The word of God is described as the perfect law of liberty. Yesterday I had a physicist sitting on the front row. And when he talks about physics, we're talking about laws. Like the law of gravity, when an apple falls from a tree, where does it go? It doesn't float around, go to the top of the tree, it falls to the ground. Why? Law of gravity comes in, physics, basic physics. Here God's word is described as basic physics. There's a law, and it's a perfect, not mean imperfect, but a perfect law of physics that will bring liberty to every area of your life. Does it just say some areas of your life? It says a perfect law of liberty, meaning every area, home, marriage, finances, dreams, vision, destiny, uh, your checkbook, your savings account, your job, relatives, friends, everything in life will bring freedom. And let me tell you something, it only comes, and you're made to understand this, that the law of God's physics is the word of God. And when you look into the perfect law of God's physics that brings you to freedom, and continue in it and are not a forgetful here but a doer so look at this here we find somebody who takes the word of God continues in it and doesn't forget it but is a doer of the not the word what's the word up there work in other words you got to get in and make this work God tells you what to do, now you gotta get in and do it. So basically, two things. You gotta hear it, you gotta do it, and then look at this, continue in it. Because if you don't continue in it, you will hear it, you will do it today, but a month from now you stop to forget about it, and now you get all caught back up in the world and you find yourself wondering what happened to God. It didn't work. When it works, you didn't. Three things hear it, do it, continue in it. That simple. And the last part of the verse, this one will be blessed in what he does. That's a promise from God, my friends. Didn't say, even clarify what it is you do. You will be blessed, and you, you will be blessed. You, don't you want to be? You will be blessed in what he does. My goodness, that's a promise from God. How do you get there? Hear it, do it, not rebel against it, not to put it behind you or treat it as if it's no importance. Hear it, do it, and continue in it. That's what this is all about. And listen to me, my friends. According to God and his promise, he says, and this one will be blessed in what he does. I don't know about you, but you see the words, this one? And you say, Pastor, you're too old to get blessed. I don't care. I don't care what you think or what your eyes see. You're just out of focus with me. I may be pushing 70, but I want you to know something. I am just getting started because I got God on my side. <laughs> yeah, so let grandpa teach you something. You never had grandpa ever teach you anything in your life. You ought to have something. Hear it, do it, continue, and get blessed. Finish. Come on now, somebody, give the Lord a great big praise. Woo! I just want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you leave. Nobody get up, nobody leave, nobody move, nobody talk. Let's listen for a moment. You do not get to heaven because you're a nice person. You don't get to heaven because you're good. You don't get to heaven because you say you love God. You don't get to heaven because you go to church. You don't get to heaven because you pray once in a while. You don't get to heaven because you sing in a choir of somebody's church or help the pastor out. You get to heaven because you follow what Jesus said. Jesus says these words. I didn't. Jesus said it. He said about himself, I am the way, 
the truth, and the life. And no man goes to the Father, in other words, you can't get to heaven, except by me. You're not going to get there your way, my way, some well-meaning church committee's way. You're not going to get there because your mommy and your daddy baptized you as a kid or christened you as a child or took you to catechism, Sunday school, or Sabbath school class. You're going to get to heaven Jesus' way, and he tells us exactly that way in Scripture. John 3rd chapter says you must be born again. Most people that attend American churches don't know what born again means, but I'll tell you. Now listen to me. If he said that's how you're going to get to heaven, then you need to hear this. Here's what born again means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. It means you've given God all your heart. You've given God all your life. Listen to me. Listen, listen, listen. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. I'll prove it to you all or nothing. Last book in the Bible, book of Revelation, Jesus is speaking. He says, I'm coming again, and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he really just said? He really just said these words. People that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all. Let's define for you and for me what lukewarm is. Lukewarm is a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, token prayer, occasional church attendance, that's lukewarm. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. And it won't work, and God knows it. And today, God brought you in here because this is a divine appointment you have with God to give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. You've had a lot of appointments in your life. You had appointments with doctors and plumbers and painters and people in your life. But I'm here to tell you, today, God brought you here because this is a divine appointment you have with God to get right with God and give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. It's an all our nothing relationship always has been. God forgive us in American churches for 250 years. We have forgot about that. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. And today you can give him all of your heart. Today you can give him all of your life. Today you can be born again, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell. It's your call. So here we are in this safe and friendly place. We've laughed, we've clapped, we've sung. You were great listening to the word of God today, but that won't get you to heaven. You're going to have to do something by giving God all your heart, giving God all your life. You've got to give it to him because he's not a thief to rob it from you. It's your heart and life. He's not a conniver to talk you out of him, a manipulator to make you do it. Stop and think about it. He could have made a trillion robots that look just like you to shout his praises and worship him, but he didn't. He made you, and then he gave you a free will choice. Will you give all of your heart and life to him, or won't you? And it's your call today. If you haven't done that, get ready to do it. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up and put it right back down. You say, Pastor Jim, why do I have to raise my hand? Because Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. That's what Jesus said. If you confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll see your hand go up. He said these words, but if you sit there and do nothing when you know you need to give him all of your heart, you need to give him all of your life. I already know you know who he is in your head, but it's not about what's in your head. It's about what you've done with your heart. Have you given him all of your heart? Have you given him all of your life? Today is your day of salvation. I'm counting to three. Pop my hands together, and you can raise your hand all across this auditorium. You say, Pastor, but I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh, you might be, but it's better to be embarrassed in this safe place than to be in hell forever and ever because you care more about what people think. Come on, shake yourself. It's more important that God sees you than what people think. So today, even if you are embarrassed, get ready to put your hand up and let's get right with God all across this auditorium. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, 
three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five. Thank you. Back over here. Six. Thank you. Seven. Thank you. There's eight. Is that one back there? Wave at me if it is. Good. I see you. Eight. Thank you. Anybody else? There's that nine, ten. Thank you. Back over there on this side. Anybody else? Real quick. There's 11, 12 in the family room. Thank you. 13, 14. Thank you. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Thank you. 21. Thank you in this family room. Real good. There's 21, 22, 23. It could be 25. But here's what I want you to do. All 25 of you are 21 of you, whatever their number is, that raise your hand. Those of you that didn't raise your hand but you should have, I want you to listen to instructions. You know you need to give God all of your heart and all of your life. I want you to get a moment, all your stuff together. Get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible friend, get your stuff. Get in the aisle and meet me right here in front. We're going to pray with you to invite Jesus back in the family rooms. Ushers, get up there and help them out with their children. Come on, get back up there and help them out with their children. If they raise their hand, everybody that's in this, nobody leaves during this period of time. It's rude. I want you to get out of your seat. If you're serious about God, meet me right here in front. Let's welcome them as they come. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Sure. Come on, come on, come on, come on. And you're all. Come on. And you're all I ever need. Let him in. Come on. Come on home. Come on home. Cause you're all Come on home. I want. How me know you are near. Well, thank God you guys have all come. I'm just excited about this. Look to your left. See Pastor Dave. He's going to pray with you, give you some free stuff. He's going to tell you about a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers to help you get strong in Jesus so you don't fall through the cracks. Only takes a few moments. The people you came with, they'll wait for you. Is that okay? Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Dave right over that way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs>